Good morning, good afternoon. I am Ginger Cox. I am the education coordinator at the Carl Sandburg Home. And I am delighted and honored to be here with you today. So many thanks to Bill Ramsey and the Blue Ridge Community College for hosting the Blue Ridge Book Fest. And thank you to all of you for being here. So we are gathered here today to celebrate words and the power that words have had on our lives and the impact that they have had on the lives of others. And Carl Sandburg's words had a profound impact on the nation. And as we, the National Park Service, celebrate our 100th birthday, we were established in 1916, and have over 400 national park sites across the nation. It was the same year that Carl Sandburg, 1916, produced his Chicago poems. So we are celebrating 100 years of the Park Service, and uh, the park is also celebrating the 100 years of Sandburg's Chicago poems. Sandberg became known as the poet of the people because he expressed the voice of America through the language of the people. And his words range from profound to profane, from witty and whimsical to nonsensical, deep and abiding and poignant and sometimes raw. And as some critics might say, rambling and verbose in some cases. Sandberg said, here is the difference between Dante and Milton and me. They wrote about hell and never saw the place. I wrote about Chicago after looking the city over for years and years. <laughs> Sandberg's parents, August and Clara Sandberg, came to this country as immigrants. And they came here as many immigrants did and do because it was the land of opportunity, the land of promise, a place where one could work and, with a little determination, make a home for yourself and, and uh, provide for your family. As a youngster, Sandberg watched his father work 10-hour days, six days a week. No retirement, no benefits, no insurance. And as he grew into a young adult, he witnessed a time that our nation was trying to reconstruct itself and adjust to changing social and economic conditions. A nation that quickly moved into the Industrial Revolution, where immigrants were coming to this country in waves to find opportunity and gainful employment, and that provided a ready labor force. So as a young man, Sandberg sought opportunities to earn money. He had a paper route as early as nine years old, and uh, he loved to uh, deliver the newspapers and hit them sma spank against the door. And he said that it put him in the, the heart of the city, what was going on in Galesburg, and in the heart of the headlines. And he remarked that one day on his paper route, he saw two men arguing on the street corner, and he said, it was the first time I ever saw politics run hot in the blood of men. Sandberg's mother bought him his first cyclopedia, and he remembers that his father was furious because it cost a day's wages, and to him, a book. To the frugal August Sandberg, a book was a frivolous waste of money but clearly it propelled Sandberg into his life direction. He said when his mother opened the pages of that book, those funny little squiggly lines and dashes revealed a story and incited his fascination and love of words. So he became a collector of words. When he finished eighth grade, and his father could no longer work, Sandberg quit school and juggled numerous part-time jobs, and he 
talked his dad into buying him a ticket into the city of Chicago, a train ticket. It would be the first time he would go by himself. He was 18 years old. And even though he was only 18 when he first saw the city of Chicago, it was to become the muse for much of his future writings. The first trip fueled his wanderlust and sense of adventure, and he took off across the country as a hobo. And he kept a journal about his travels. He sang campfire songs with other hobos. He slept under the stars. He worked a wheat harvest in Kansas. He washed dishes in Colorado. He shucked corn in Nebraska, and in general absorbed the sights and sounds of the Midwest. He took notes of interesting people and places and stories, and his wanderlust exposed him to the rich fabric of people's lives. Throughout his life and his travels, he collected the songs that he heard on his, on his journeys. Um, they were songs of bricklayers and field workers and factory workers. They were songs of work and struggle, songs of freedom and dreams, he publishes the American Song Bag in 1927 with over 300 uniquely American folk songs. Ballads, work songs, minstrel songs, jail songs. Sandberg says in his American Song Bag, the American Song Bag comes from the hearts and voices of thousands of men and women. They made new songs, they changed old songs, they carried songs from place to place. They resurrected and kept alive dead and dying songs. Ballad singers from centuries ago and mule skinners alive and singing today helped make this book. Pioneers, pick and shovel men, teamsters, mountaineers, and people often called ignorant have their hands and voices in this book, along with minstrels, sophisticates, and trained musicians. People of lonesome hills and valleys are joined with the city slicker in the panorama of its pages. In 1898, Carl serves briefly in the Spanish-American War and is granted an honorary high school diploma. He's later accepted at Lombard College where he takes, he's interested in so many classes that he takes a variety of classes, fully enough classes and credits to graduate, but none of the classes were aligned to actually earn him a degree. So he said it was most important to him to gain the knowledge and the learning. And after, after he quit college, he spent some time traveling around the country, once again, selling stereographs on a bicycle with a satchel. And when asked, why in the world are you traveling around on a bicycle stero selling stereographs, his answer was so simple, but so profound. He said, I feel that it's important to expand people's view of their world. And these stereograph images were images of countries and cultures all over the place. So Sandberg's first editorial experience was with Lombard College, and he eventually lands a job with the Chicago Tribune as a journalist in the late 1900s. And he began echoing the voice of the people on a much deeper level. Sandberg's ideals were challenged as he found his voice in speaking for those who had no voice. Despite the fact that this nation was founded on principles of equality and justice and freedom for everybody, that's not the America that Sandberg saw. He saw women with no right to vote and own property. He saw men rallying in the streets with picket signs demanding radical labor reform, like the 40-hour work week and fair wages and safe working conditions. He watched issues of segregation and Jim Crow laws, and these experiences helped him gain valuable appreciation for the struggles of the working class and the issues of social strata. He felt that workers were essential to the success of the Industrial Revolution. And during the Chicago race riots, he went down into the streets where the disenfranchised black community were rioting, and he spoke with them, and he heard their concerns, and he published the Chicago race riots in 1919, and it echoed the social and economic conditions of their lives. 
He used his, platform for a his voice as a platform for a variety of social issues, child labor, war, social injustice, and workers striving toward that ever-elusive American dream. In his poem, The Mob, from Chicago Poems, I am the people, the mob, the crowd, the mass. Do you know that all of the great work of the world is done through me? I am the working man, the inventor, the maker of the world's food and clothing. I am the audience that witnesses history. I send forth Napoleons and Lincolns, and they die. And then I send forth more Napoleons and Lincolns, and they die. I am the seed ground. I am the prairie that will stand for much plowing. Terrible storms pass over me. I forget. The best of me is sucked out and wasted, and I forget. Everything but death comes to me and makes me work and give up what I have, and I forget. Sometimes I growl, shake myself, and spatter a few red drops for history to remember. And then I forget. When I, the people, learn to remember, when I, the people, learn to use the lessons of yesterday and no longer forget who played me for a fool, who robbed me last year, then there will be no speaker in all the world, say the name, the people, with any flare of a uh, snick in his voice and no far-off smile of derision. The mob, the crowd, the mass will arrive then. From the industrial north to the agricultural south, young children labors, labored in coal mines and fiber mills. And Spanberg spoke to this issue. In his book, Chicago Poems, they will say, of my city, the worst that men will say is this, you took little children away from the sun and the dew and the reckless rain and the glimmers that played in the grass under the great sky, and you put them to work behind walls, broken and smothered, to eat dust in their little throats and die empty-hearted for a little handful of pay on a few Saturday nights. Sandberg grew up in the middle of Reconstruction, so Abraham Lincoln, Civil War, those were common talk of the town. His brief wartime service was followed by our nation's involvement in World War I and World War II, and Sandberg expresses some very deep feelings in this poem called Killers. I am singing to you soft as a man with a dead child speaks, hard as a man in handcuffs held where he cannot move. Under the sun are 16 million men chosen for shining teeth, sharp eyes, hard legs, and a running of young, warm blood in their wrist. And a red juice runs on the green grass and a red juice soaks the dark soil, and the 16 million are killing and killing and killing. I never forget them, day or night. They beat on my head for the memory of them. They pound on my heart, and I cry back at them, to their homes and dreams, to their women and games. I wake in the night and smell the trenches, and hear the low stir of sleepers in lines, 16 million sleepers and pickets in the dark, some of them long sleepers for always, some of them tumbling to sleep tomorrow for always, fixed in the drag of the world's heartbreak, eating and drinking and toiling on a long job of killing, 16 million men. Sandberg recalls a turning point in his life 
when he was walking through the college at Lombard com uh, campus and he stopped at the marker that reflected the words that Lincoln spoke the day of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And this day left an indelible impression on the young Sandberg, and it began a lifelong search to discover more of this man that Sandberg described as both steel and velvet. In his address to the 1959 session, joint session of Congress, Sandberg says, not often in the story of mankind does a man arrive on earth who is both steel and velvet, who is as hard as rock and soft as the drifting fog, who holds in his heart and mind the paradox of a terrible storm and peace unspeakable and perfect. Here and there across the centuries come reports of men alleged to have these contrasts and the incomparable Abraham Lincoln is an approach, if not a perfect realization, of this character. Sandberg ultimately produces a six-volume biography of Abraham Lincoln, and he receives a Pulitzer Prize for the war years, the four-volume set. So through his many writings, Carl Sandberg conveys the struggles of the working class, but he also wrote of the indomitable spirit of the people, saying, the people have come far, and they will come farther still. He wrote of hope and dreams, the beauty of nature, finding happiness in, and joy in the simple and commonplace things, the stuff of life. In his book, Harvest Moon, Sandberg says, I was born on the prairie, and the milk of its wheat, and the red of its clover, and the eyes of its women gave me a song and a slogan. As he watched farmers laboring in the fields to provide our nation and their families food, it provided a great fuel for his poetry in his poem, Haystacks. After the sunburn of the day and the eggs and the biscuit and the coffee, the pearl gray haystacks in the gloaming are cool prayers to the harvest hands. Sandberg's love of children and the hope that they represent and innocence is reflected in many of his words and works. He created rutabaga stories originally for his grandchildren because he felt that America needed her own folk tales, that we had very European-based tales with lots of knights and kings and queens and castles. So his stories featured the landscapes that he traveled on, the trains he rode on, and the working-class characters that he met. Stories with titles like The Potato-Faced Blind Man, Henry Hagley Hoagley, and The Huckabuck Family, who were corn huskers in Nebraska. <laughs> Even the weather takes on a persona in The White Horse Girl and The Blue Wind Boy. The early morning wind is strong as the prairie, and whatever I tell it, I know it believes and remembers. And the night wind with the big dark night sky curves, the night wind gets inside of me and understands my secrets. And the blue wind of the times in between, when it is neither dark nor light in the dusk, this is the wind that asks me questions and tells me to wait, and it will bring me whatever I want. He also wrote poems for children like, Little girl, be careful what you say. Little girl, be careful what you say when you make talk with words. Words, words are made of syllables, and syllables, child, are made of air. And air is so thin, air is the breath of God. 
Air is finer than fire or mist, finer than water or moonlight, finer than spider webs in the dawn, finer than water flowers in the morning. And words are strong, too, strong like rocks and steel, and stronger than potatoes and corn and fish and cattle, and soft, too, soft as little pigeon eggs, soft as the beating of a hummingbird's wings. So little girl, when you speak greetings, when you make wishes, tell jokes, or have prayers, be careful, be careless, be careful, be what you wish to be. Sandberg throughout his life received numerous awards. One for his complete poems, a Pulitzer Prize, another Pulitzer Prize for Abraham Lincoln, the four-volume biography, and then he won a special Pulitzer Prize for his book, Honey and Salt, which he wrote right here at Flat Rock, uh, because there was no Pulitzer Prize for poetry in the day, and they felt he needed an award anyway. So he was the first to get an award as a poet with the Pulitzer Prize. He also received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, but the award that he was most proud of was an award given to him by the NAACP for his lifelong struggle to extend the frontiers of social justice. Sandberg saw inspiration in the world around him, from cities to prairies, from meadows to mountains. His early life, his exposure to people and places across the landscape of America gave him insight, inspiration to, to write about what he saw in the language of the people, not the gussied up rhymes of poetry. So he came under a lot of criticism and scrutiny for his style of poetry, but it's also what propelled him uh, as a writer. Sandberg once said, a man must go away by himself to sit on a rock in the forest and to ask of himself, who am I, where have I been, and where am I going? He had a chance to reflect on that concept here in the mountains of North Carolina at Flat Rock Home, Connemara, where he spent the last 22 years of his life. Sandberg met his bride-to-be, Lillian Steichen, in 1907. She was brilliant. She went to University of Illinois and then graduated from University of Chicago with a degree in literature and philosophy. She spoke fluent Latin, French, German, and English and could read and write fluently in those languages. And she was doing some editing for a political party which Sandberg had aligned himself with. You might imagine the Socialist Democratic Party. She delivered her package of transcriptions, and Sandberg recalls that he was instantly smitten by her beauty, her sparkling blue eyes, her vivacious personality. He confesses that uh, after talking with her, he was equally intimidated by her intelligence, but he musters up enough courage to ask her out to dinner, and she very politely declines his invitation. But not to be daunted, he suggested that he at least walk her to the train station. And as they're walking to the train station, clever fella that he was, he suggested that he should send her some political literature, but would need her address. He, <laughs> he got her address. He sent the literature as promised, but he tucked a couple of poems in the envelope for good measure. And Mrs. Sandberg, well, at the time, Lillian Steichen, as a teacher, rem remembered that she simply wrote him back to encourage him to keep writing. He recalls it, he says, when I was a pretty poor poet, this dark-haired girl told me to keep on. <laughs> they began a six-month courtship of correspondence. They literally grew to know and love each other through the power of the written word. They realized that their philosophies and ideals were very much aligned, and they married six months after meeting, were married for nearly 60 years. 
So they, it was actually Mrs. Sandberg that prompted them to come to the mountains of North Carolina. It was 1945, and he had just received his Pulitzer Prize for his Abraham Lincoln War years. And they were both grandparents, and she was already well known for raising champion dairy goats. And she said, you know, I'd like to live where there's greener pastures and a milder climate. And he said, I don't care where we live. Just give me a quiet garret alone where I can write. And that's what they found when they came to Flat Rock, North Carolina and found the lovely 245-acre Connemara Farms, which had the lovely home and grounds, the, form, the farm and forest, the fields, all the outbuildings that supported the barn operation, but it also supported the quiet and solitude that he needed. When he passed away in 1967, he was almost 90 years old, and when he died, she did not want his legacy to die with him. She wanted him to be remembered for the powerful poet and author and writer that he was in speaking for the American people. Mrs. Sandberg's, uh, when they moved here, they brought um, 17,000 books with them here to Connemara. So you think they like to read <laughs> 17,000 books. So she made some modifications to the house to hold all the books. Um, the estate has been there since 1838. So some of you who are new to the area, um, we, we uh, are undertaking a pretty intensive restoration project to do some work on the house to keep the legacy of the house alive forever as well. So I think Sandberg and Mrs. Sandberg would be well pleased with the idea that we are here today sharing about Sandberg's legacy and that the Park Service preserves and protects his amazing story. Today at Connemara, we offer guided house tours. We have special events, uh, such as this one that we're at, and we do a lot of outreach. We have a fabulous bookstore where we sell a number of Carl Sandburg's literary works, and of course, other memorabilia uh, about the farm. And I think one of our most compelling programs to carry on the Sandburg legacy is, as Bill Ramsey mentioned at the beginning, is our opportunity to host a writer in residence. Um, we are delighted this year to welcome Kimberly Sib Sims Gibbs to our area across the state line. And um, I would love to save a few minutes for her to speak, but I would like to know if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask about Carl Sandburg or about the farm, Connemara Farms. Yes, ma'am. So the question is, where did his parents come from? And Clara and August Sandburg were Swedish. So they moved here from Sweden, and Sandburg was a first-generation American. All right. Other questions? Yes, sir. What did he write while at Connemara? He was 67 when he moved there and still produced one third of his entire life works. So he pulled together his life work of poetry, which was 1,000, give or take a few poems. He condensed his six-volume Lincoln biography into one, and he wrote his own autobiography, Always the Young Strangers, and then he put together Honey and Salt. That question reminds me of uh, a little side note here. I thought you guys might uh, ask me who, what authors he likes. He wanted Emerson and Whitman in every room. And I love this, John Steinbeck and Ernest Hemingway, when they received their uh, Nobel Prize, were quoted as saying, 
it should have gone to Carl Sandburg. <laughs> That's pretty impressive to me. All right, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What can I tell you about the goats? The, yes, that's a great question. Um, interestingly enough, Mrs. Sandberg has a bit of a legacy as well. She is credited with helping to found the American Dairy Goat Association, and she bred goats and raised goats and showed them, and her uh, one of the goats, Jennifer too, held the world record in milk production. And so she is honored in the agricultural circles for her contributions, and we carry on her legacy by having descendants of her champion dairy goats at the farm. So it, it does help to create the rhythms that the family had there at the Connemara Farms. All right, I think we'd like to turn it over to Kimberly. All right, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here. As Kimberly's coming up, I'll tell you a little bit about her. She dedicates her time and work as a teaching artist and writing for young adults. She holds a master's in English from Clemson University with a creative writing thesis on the textile mills of South Carolina. Her poetry has appeared in numerous literary journals such as Poem, the South Carolina Review, the Asheville Poetry Review, Cackalack, and Eclipse. She has also been a featured performer and reader internationally at festivals and venues, including Battersea Art Center London, the Institute of Contemporary Arts London, Chopin Theater Chicago, Blumenthal Performing Arts Center, the Peace Center, Leaf Festival, and Artisphere. And she is working on her first young adult novel. Let's give it up. For And that, let's get up for Ginger for that wonderful presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Kimberly Sims, and I'm just from over the mountains. Um, I live off of um, Highway 25, just across the border in South Carolina. Um, so I think the theme of mountain life is quite appropriate for me, um, since me and my 16 chickens um, and my family live um, in the mountains of South Carolina. Um, like Carl Sandburg, I'm also a first generation American. Uh, both of my parents are from England, uh, but I did grow up in Greenville, South Carolina. The first poem that I wanted to read today is kind of a little bit of a nod to my English father and my parents' love um, for fortune tellers. Uh, when I grew up, my father used to love to go and visit uh, various fortune tellers in different parts of the state, although he says it's not the same as the European gypsies. Um, so this poem that I'm going to read first is called Fortune Tellers. Fortune tellers never look like you expect them to. This one has hairsprayed blonde bangs, purple eyeshadow, and boulder-like amethyst rings. The room smells of country rose. Last time it was a middle-aged black woman, natural with short hair and beige fingernails. She wore feather earrings and whispered, stop punishing yourself. This is common. Fortune tellers often urgently grab your wrist as you descend steps to impart an ambiguous shred of direction. Dad likes to have his cards read, while well, I prefer palm readings. Lifelines and crease countings remind me of cartography. We avoid the ones with crystal balls and hoop earrings. Wearing a purple turban is suspect in our books. Fortunes change constantly. Fortune tellers are like weathermen. It doesn't always rain, but carrying an umbrella never hurt anyone. Thank you. Um, 
Since my parents are English, I'm actually a dual citizen. So I did, after graduating from Furman University, go and live in London for about three years, which was a wonderful experience. Um, and this next poem I'm going to share um, happened during uh, a certain May when there was, a, uh, I think, an anti-capitalist riot in the street. I did not realize that was happening when I went out for my lunch break um, until I found myself in the middle of this kind of madness. Um, and so I wrote a poem about it, um, and this appears in a, um, an anthology called Growing Up Girl. May Anti-Capitalist Riots, London. That's the McDonald's I did not smash. I did not throw a chair through glass. I did not crush the register with a rock. I did not fling the burgers to dogs. That's the cement I did not shatter. I did not plant flowers in the black dirt. I did not make mud statues against the wall. I did not create a gorilla garden. That's the bank door I did not brick up. That's the graffiti I did not dab. That's the plastic mask I did not wear. That's the bridge I did not blockade. That's the window where I watched it happen. Saw the carnival costumes, heard the chanting. That's the office where I was typing letters. That was the riot I did not join. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to actually read a few poems now. And actually, that poem appears in this book called Quintet that was published by 96 Press. I understand that Malaprop's books, the wonderful bookstore from Asheville, is here selling all the wonderful um, books from all these wonderful authors. Um, but this book is available on Amazon if you want to pick it up at a later date. Um, so my other little collection is called Lindy Lee, Songs on Mill Hill. Um, my husband's family were all sharecroppers until they became textile workers. Um, and so I did a lot of research combined with some family histories to make this collection based around a fictional mill worker called Lindy Lee. Um, the first poem, though, in the collection is actually written from the point of view of the textile mill itself. And I wanted to share this poem because it was inspired and kind of gives a nod to Carl Sandburg's Chicago poem. And this is called The Cotton Mill Song, 1930. Thread spinner, loom weaver, cloth maker to the world. Doffers, smashers, slashers, whipping, sweltering, and worn. It is true what they tell you. I am wicked, with my women weaving through throbbing nights under the electric light. And yes, Yes, they say I am cruel, for I have slaughtered the little child and then brought another to fill his place. And they tell you I am vile, but my reply is, in the cheeks of girls and the ribs of toddlers, I have instilled the hollows of hunger. And still, still I will turn to those indolent idealists who huff at our speeding machines and say to them, come, come and show me a grander temple to our industry with brick walls buzzing through sunrises and hailstorms and snap frost. Show me another place where the indigent, the illiterate, the slow, the widowed are, are set to toil so assiduously in sweat-soaked aprons and wild dripping hair, spouting steam and thick oil. I cast long shadows across the mountain. I sing my swollen song timber as dulcimer strings, flushed, defiant, racing, thumping, heaving on the floor, cotton coating my woman's skin, singing with hands like wrens, fueling the machinery of America, 
and singing the way only a burdened soul can sing, with chin thrown forward and heart sour as ukulele, humming, beating a foot on the cotton-covered pine, blood pumping to the pulse of the loom, singing, singing the heavy, linty, violent song of the worker, sinewy, sweat-soaked, proud to be, thread spinner, loom weaver, cloth maker to the world. Okay, I'm just going to read just a few short more poems. <laughs> Um, so basically, one of the things that happened, I think, kind of in the 1890s through the early 1900s was people were moving from uh, sharecropping into the cities um, and the promises that they would have these wonderful, rich lives at the textile mills. And for many of them, it was actually a big improvement. And so this short little lyric poem is called Mama Song. We grew up with feet in red dirt knew nothing but the rushing of our little creek. We grew potatoes, tobacco, oaky, and maters. All us helped Ma and Daddy picking. Sometimes when I smell honey as March starts to warm, I turn towards the purple trees and I think of that little farm. When we moved on the mill hill, I saw the electric lights I dreamed of ribbons in my hair. I figured that we were rich. Didn't matter no more about rain. Six days a week, I stand at the frames, dreaming the songs of pulsing cicadas. Um, thank you. Okay, I'm just, this one is called Blue Pains. Uh, there were many, Yet yeah, this is the last one. Um, there were many uh, textile mills um, that had colored glass in them. Um, and the one that I visited actually had blue glass. But unfortunately, in the 1960s, they did have to break up those windows as they moved from uh, into polyester as well as into multiple shifts. Um, so that the workers would not be as, as aware that they were working during the night. And so this is called Blue Pains with the epigraph, In the 1960s, the distinctive blue windows of the mill were bricked up in favor of modern fluorescent lights. Lindy Lee, mill worker. Indigo, cobalt, azure, Protection from the evil eye or wandering ghouls. Cool icy streams, the color of heaven. Jesus' robes, hyacinth blooms. I always love those windows. Forty years those blue eyes met mine, a window to the soul. Mr. Stevenson sent the boys up on ladders, smashing laughing with each rain of blue tears, blue tick, blue bird, blueberry, shard settled in the grass and shone in the streaming sun like a thousand eyes. Who knew mortar could be spread so fast? By day end, we stood in the fluorescent lights, surrounded on all sides by endless brick, but the debris called to us like jewels to crows. We couldn't help but pick up the shards, filling our aprons with textured glass, then stringing our porches with their blue song. Thank you very much. You are watching BRCC-TV, the education channel.